continue with our agenda for today, the first day of the 15th Annual Partners Conference of UCNCS Global and UCNCS America. So let us continue with the presentation of India yesterday, today, and tomorrow. We will ask public accountant Raimundo Rosas to please be so kind as to introduce Dr. Banerjee. Thank you, Raimundo. <coughs> Dr. Ishita Banerjee is professor and researcher with tenure in the Asia and Africa Studies Center of El Colegio de Mexico. She's a level three researcher in the National Research Center. She made her master's degree in the University of Calcutta, and she was a gold medal winner. She's also the author of four books. Mauricio Mubarak and myself were talking to Dr. Banerjee in El Colegio de Mexico, and she shared with us a perspective of India, which she promised to extend and bring up to date for today's presentation. She is truly passionate about the two countries, Mexico and India, and she has a loving relationship with both of them. She is a researcher with a very 
complete and comprehensive overview of the areas of study that she covers. And so, without further ado, I will give her the floor so that she talks to us about India as one of the members of the BRICS, as well as the future role that India will have in the world. Especially, as Hugo Lopez Araiza was saying, considering the tremendous impact of the domestic market in India, a whole different perspective to what happens in Mexico and in China. This focus on the domestic market that India has. So let me give the floor to Dr. Banerjee. Good morning. And thank you very much, Mr. Mubarak and Mr. Rosas, for inviting me here. It's an honor and a privilege to be here with you today. But I do apologize. I am a sociocultural historian, and I realize that I am not really a part of the financial world. I can't really talk much about the economy of India uh, or the BRICS. I had suggested that they invited someone else to talk about the economic perspective. So if you will allow me, I would rather want to give you a historical overview of India and the socio-cultural reality of India. And when you think you've had enough, then just let me know, give me a sign, and I will wrap up my presentation. So this would be a good moment to look at other things besides figures. Yes, the truth is I really know nothing about maths numbers and statistics, so I don't even know what I'm doing here. But okay, as you can see, I chose a cartoon strip. This used to be the perspective of India. Y esto, niños, es la India, la tierra misteriosa de doctores, ingenieros y encantadores de serpientes. So, my idea is to share with you a different perspective, a different way of seeing my country and its history. Sharing a historical, political, and cultural overview of India in just an hour is near impossible. The concept of India itself and how it came to be has been the subject of debate and analysis amongst experts. We could go back to ancient times and to some others they go back to colonial times when we were British possession. India has a country, has a history of almost 5,000 years, a very rich, rich population in both quantity and quality, as we saw in the previous presentation, very culturally diverse. It is a multi-ethnic and multi-linguistic country, so offering you a comprehensive perspective of all of that variety is very difficult. I will try to avoid falling in the pitfall of giving you a biased or a partial vision. You mentioned the elephant, so I will try not to give you a biased or partial perspective so that you are not confused like the proverbial blind men in the poet Sufi Jalan poem used to say. According to this poet, when someone touched the different parts of an elephant, blind men described it based on the part that they were feeling. So to some, an elephant seemed to be a, seemed to be a pillar seemed to be a water pipe or seemed to be whatever, but no one could imagine what it was on the whole. So in an attempt to give you a full vision of what India is, I will focus on some key aspects which, in my opinion, show the true colors of India and the foundations to be able to understand the Indian culture. 
which are, of course, eternally changing. I will also I will also leave it up to you to form your own vision, your own criteria of what India is. Before going back to the historical overview, I would like to share some key figures, facts and figures. I am also technologically challenged, which is why I am reading and I move on to the next slide in the wrong moments, but okay. Some very basic facts. India is the seventh largest country in the world and the second most populated country in the world. These are facts that we all know. It has three million. 600,000 square kilometers and a population of 1.28 billion people according to the 2011 population census. Could we move on to the next slide? We'll come back to, to this, but these aren't the facts that I'm looking for. The, the demographic indexes. Geographically, India is divided into three, the Himalayas and the northern mountain range, the northern plains, and the diverse southern area with the, that is surrounded by the seas, which is the peninsula of India. To the northwest, it is neighbored by Pakistan, then Nepal, and Myanmar, which used to be Burma. We also have neighbor of Bangladesh on three sides. We have the Bengal Bay, the Bengal Bay, or Bengal Gulf, as they know it in some places, and the Arab Sea. In India, there are a wide variety of nations, ethnic groups, and religious groups. It is the cradle of some of the most important civilizations and religions, among which we can find Hinduism and Buddhism. These indigenous religions now also have Islam and Christianity in the country, but the majority of our population is Hindi, which are approximately four-fifths of our population. The Muslim group is the largest minority. You might be surprised to hear that there are more Muslims in India than in Pakistan because of the vast population that we have. So the Muslim group are the largest minority, approximately 138 million people, over one-tenth of the total population, followed by Christians, Sikhs, and Buddhists. Those are some figures that you can see on the slides. The language diversity in India is also amazing. There are hundreds of languages grouped under several families, out of which 22 have been recognized by the Indian government. Three-fourths of the population speak a language coming from Sanskrit, amongst which we find Hindi, the most spoken language in the country, and also known as the official national language, Bengali and Meraki, which are the second and third, respectively. Then the next language is the Telugu, which is of the Bravidic family, spoken in the southern part of the continent. I think I might be speaking a little bit too quickly, but that's okay. Regarding the economy of India, and these are just some very base, basic figures, the agricultural sector is the most important economic sector for the population of India, but it represents only 13.7% according to the 2012-2013 figures of India's GDP. India is the 10th largest economy in the world in terms of its GDP and the third in terms of purchasing power parity. It is 
part of the G20, the top 20 largest economy, top 20 largest global trade partner, according to the World Trade Organization, and it is part of the BRICS, as you all know. In 2013, it was the 19th largest exporter of goods and assets and the sixth exporter of produce of services with an economic growth rate of almost 7%, maybe even more, in the first decade of the 2000s, we and now have fallen to 4.7% in the last fiscal year, although the International Monetary Fund project a growth in the GDP of 5.4% for the next fiscal year, 2014-2015. The manufacturing sector has also become important together with the services industry they have a very important domestic market in India, as you have said, so it has had continual growth, although the sector that has grown at a more accelerated rate has been the services sector, which includes TI, software, and telecommunications, and tourism, traveling, education, construction, infrastructure, trade, banking, among other sectors that have also experienced growth in the past few years. And now I will head on to the area of my expertise. The Indian Society of the Hindi community is organized in a caste system, an organization that is hierarchical and interdependent where prohibitions of marriage and associations are very strict. Also, the very strict norms of conduct and behavior for each caste where purity and impurity also have an impact on the hierarchical level. Contrary to the very simplistic view of the caste system, our reality shows a very heterogeneous world. Every Every religion and every culture and ethnicity has its own case with different economic, religious, and power categories. Now, if you could go back to some of the previous slides that I have. Regarding the political system, India is the largest democracy in the world, made up of 29 states. A few months ago, Andhra Pradesh and Teres Nal were separate. Now uh, they are 29, though before they were 28. But could you go back to the map? Because this one is the most current map that I could find. That border changed a few months ago. Telekana, who, which used to be a part of Andhra Pradesh. <laughs> We have a bicameral Congress elected for five-year terms. India has a multi-party parliamentary system. The bicameral parliament is elected for five-year terms. The lower chamber, Lok Sabha, has members of parliament that are elected through popular vote, while the higher chamber has members that are both appointed and elected through popular vote. This same pattern is replicated in the parliaments of each province or state where the local bicameral legislatures also elect the representatives to the lower chamber headed by chief ministers in the parliament who is called Prime Minister of India, and then in the provinces, Chief Ministers. There are leaders of the parties that win majority in each province. The President is the head of state. If we could move on to the next slide. The next one, please. OK. That is our current President, and that is the Parliament where the president has his office in New Delhi. 
Then that's a picture of the Republic Day Parade in January 26th, which is when the Indian Constitution was enacted, January 26, 1950, so that is the day where there is a celebration parade. So that was the enactment of the Constitution, yes, January 26th. The president is the head of state and he is elected for a five-year term by an electoral college made up by the members elect of the two cameras of the parliament and the local legislatures, but his role is mostly a protocol and ceremonial. The representatives, the president has representatives in each province, although the executive power is held by the Council of Ministers under the leadership of the Prime Minister who is appointed by the majority of the lower chamber of the parliament or through a coalition. But the president still has the power to dissolve the elected government in the center and in the provinces in the case of emergency or crisis situations. In all of these years, since 1947 to 2014, there has only been one time of national emergency or crisis where the government, where the government was dissolved. It has only happened once under the leadership of Indira Gandhi. For 18 months, all of the civil liberties were suspended from 1975 to 77. If we could move on to the next slide, please. Here is Jawaharlal Nehru, who's our prime minister, with Indira Gandhi, his daughter, then Indira Gandhi as prime minister, and then her son, Rajiv Gandhi. Up until this point, as I said, the power to dissolve government was only used once for 18 months from 1975 to 77 under the leadership of Indira Gandhi as prime minister. Since the Indian independence in 1947 to 1975, the prime minister was always a member of the National Congress Party until 77. After the emergency, there was obviously a change in government, uh, but then she, of course, came back to power, as you all know. If we could go on to the next slide. That's the one. Okay. Now we should start looking at India's past. India, as you know, has one of the most ancient civilizations in the world, the Harappa civilization, from circa 2600 or 2300 before Christ located in the northeastern part of India today in the valley of the Indus River. And in India it used to be called Sindhu. When the Greek first arrived they could not pronounce Sa, which is why they give, gave it the name Indu, which is where the name Indian River comes from. So that is the Indus River, or in India, Indu, and well, there you go, we got the different origins of the names uh, and the translations in the, to the different languages of the river. So this was uh, an ancient civilization with its key centers in Harappa and Mohenjo-Daro, both located in current day Pakistan. And it was mostly an urban civilization with very advanced technology and trade networks with Mesopotamia, another ancient civilization. As we know, there were signs of trade in Mesopotamia, which is why we know that there was a long distance network and long distance trade. This was also a culture that developed writing, but unfortunately, writing the meaning of the, its writing hasn't been deciphered yet, so we only depend on archaeological findings to make our discoveries. So mostly what we know is the archaeological sites that were found in 1922. And that is when we started learning about India's ancient history. 
Based on the images that we now can see, apparently the population of the Indus Valley worship the goddess of fertility, although it is very difficult to find a continuum between the worship to the original deities in the Harappa period up until today. Those are the seals used for trade, and we can see, again, the writing that hasn't been deciphered yet. No, if you could go back to the previous slide. It is said that that is the proto-Shiva, which is very similar to the deity Shiva that we worship up until this day. So the Harappa culture came to an end before a civilization emerged in the Ganges River. The causes for the destruction of the Harappa culture are also not very clearly determined. Am I boring you yet? No? So far so good? Okay, thank you. In the in the 18th century, the academics and researchers of the British Western world started studying the manuscripts in ancient India that showed the languages and the language groups rather than the racial groups that exist back then. The Rig Veda manuscript is amongst the oldest that we find. And these manuscripts contain the high doctrines of philosophy and theology, and the, this period extends from 1750 to 500 before Christ. So we're still in old ancient times. The Aryans were a nomad group, pastoral group, that adopted sedentary agriculture through a long period as they extended in the north and eastern part of current day India. So the urban trade culture that was very high tech that we found in the Harappa times, there was a regression to an agricultural nomad group that we saw in this period. But the extension of the Vedic and the Vedan period, where we started seeing epic poems like the Ramadan, which was written in Sanskrit, we see still remnants of this in current Indian society. These texts, Vedic texts, also offers good insight into society of the time. In this period, the groups changed from nomad organization to sedentary groups and from popular assemblies and republics to, to dynasties in the sedentary group. In the Gang Ganges River Valley, there were dynasties and monarchies, and the Vedic society continued to develop following a Hindu-European model with a three-party society based on warriors, priests, and agriculture. So this was the beginning of the caste system, which has both confused and amazed scholars for many years. A very exciting aspect of Indian society since then has been a very composite, a very composite society, which means that it is composed of several roots at the same time. Different elements that are mixed together that lead to a very diverse culture, this composite culture. 
with many social strata and a lot of different levels of influence and cultural assimilation. With the Vedas and Upanishads that talked about a supreme being and the union of the human soul with the absolute soul as the union of that as the goal of the human life to be able to finally step out and transcend these ongoing cycles of birth and rebirth. This philosophy was challenged by the Hainism and Buddhism in the 6th century before Christ. And the arrival of the Greek civilization with Sacras and Hunas through the northwestern pass of the Himalayas in the first, between the first and eighth century after Christ were reflected on different styles of art and architecture. Buddhism and Rainism, represented by its leaders, questions the Vedic culture and the caste system with new professions at a time when the caste society was only uh, in its infancy. In the republics, these new trends were were felt and extended by the warriors, and so the Indo-Aryan civilization was mixed with the Greek influence in a very intricate fashion that led to an even more complex society. There were new kingdoms that emerged in the Gan Ganges River Valley, subjected other societies and received the influence of both the, the, the Vedas and the radical trends. This is the pillar from Emperor Ashoka, also before Christ, but as you know, that is the national symbol of India. It is the emblem that we find in the flag. So that was during the reign of Emperor Ashoka, 250 before Christ. This is just an example that illustrates the influence of Buddhism. Gupta emperors of the 5th and 6th century after Christ represented the growth of what we now know as Hinduism. The Guptas, which became an empire, but I'm talking about the 5th or 6th century after Christ. But don't worry, I will not give you all of the dates and facts and figures. I will actually be jumping ahead after we finish going over this ancient history. There was a worship of deities, especially Brahma, the creator, Vishnu, the preserver, and Shiva, the destroyer of the world, and the goddesses that emerged in beginning in the 5th century. There were many temples that were built and a very close relationship between priests and emperors and their temples. After the 8th century, there were new currents of Hinduism that were very widely spread and that led to the emergence of very powerful kingdoms, especially in between the 9th and 12th century, kingdoms that extended over Sri Lanka and the south of Asia. If you've ever been to Cambodia and other countries in that area, those are temples built in this era. With the Mongols arrived in India between the centuries 8 and 12 after Christ, and they brought new aspects to society. So ancient India gives us an image that very deeply contrasts with the stereotypes that we now have of India. If we could go on to the next slide. Similarly, from the 12th to the 17th century, there was also a lot of mixture of new peoples and new influences. Islam arrived in India in the 8th century when the Arabs conquered Sim, became a very strong presence since the moment when the first Muslim Sultan was established in Qutub Minar. If you've ever been to Delhi, Qutub Minar is very, very close to what today is New Delhi. That was built between the 12th and 13th century. 
And after the reign of that sultan, Turka Afghana, then the Mongols arrived from 1056 to the 1800s. I will not talk a lot about the South, but just to show you the diversity that you can find in India. That was another empire, Vijayanagara, from the 1300s, 1500s, and it was recently discovered, these archaeological sites with these ruins in Hampi. But okay, I, I can't really go into depth about this, but I wanted to show some pictures to you. In the next slide, okay, that I think you know, the Red Fort and the Mughal Empire in Delhi, descenders of Timur, the emperor of East of Central Asia, and the Mongol and the Mongol king Genghis, Gen, Genghis Khan brings together Turkish, Mongol, and other influences in the current Indian society that led to a new Hindu-Islamic culture that was reflected in arts, language, architectures, and even government and political system. With the urban areas in Delhi and the center of India, there were many local and regional powers with very distinct political and sociocultural customs. That is from Bengal, the Nawabs, the Nawabs who were governors, originally governors of the Mughals, that eventually became autonomous. So that is Mushidabad, which is very important to us, because that is where first the English trade company arrived to conquer Bengal. That's where a battle took place near Nishunaba. Vasco da Gama, we must also mention, arrived in Calicut, which is in the southwestern coast, in 1498. That is to say, more or less at the same time that Christopher Columbus arrived in America. So the Portuguese arrived in India to establish trade very a very few time afterwards. Then they were followed by the French and the British, amongst other European nations. Their focus on trade was very strong because the Indian Ocean was the center of a very important sea trade with Africa to the west and Southeast Asia to the east. If you picture the coast of the Bengal Bay to the east, and then from the Arab Sea, they went to the west to Africa and beyond. So what do I mean? Besides Indian textiles, there was also a high demand for clothes and species in where do you get cinnamon, for instance? Where do you think it was originally from? Sri Lanka in the 16th, 17th century. And also silver coins that they still use in India come from here, Mexico, from San Luis Potosí. So there is a lot of trade in the coastal area, spices and metals, and so the coasts were global centuries before the term globalization became popular. It was this interest in trade in India, together with the need to create a balance, was unfavorable to the British East India Company, and that led to the intervention of this company in Indian local national policies in regions where trade networks and forts had been established. So they eventually emerged as governors of Bengal and eventually India as a whole. The annexation of India was a very long process. They arrived as traders, not as conquerors or conquistadors as happened in America. So the domination would take about 100 years to be established. And after the process was over, there was a revolt against the British East India Company. 190 
years of colonial domination, British colonial domination. I have also brought many pictures just to show you the diversity of India. 190 years of colonial domination that began in 1756 with the con conquer of Bengal by the British East India Company and that culminated with the independence of India on August 15, 1947, led to very significant changes in the Indian society. The British East India Company was a trade body that carried out an administrative conquer over a period of 190 years, attempted to use local legislations and the local constitution to try to govern India with relative ease. And this is very important because India was a very liter literate co culture, very literate culture. But oral tradition was even more important. The Vedas were passed on through generations orally. Shruti is the name given to oral tradition. As many generations, after many generations, they became triti, meaning they're a part of the memory. So once the original people who had told these stories had passed away, it became part of our memory, and eventually they were written down as memories were lost as well. So it's another very important aspect of India. Customs, local traditions, oral tradition, more than written tradition. But the British, when they were looking for a new constitution and laws or something in India to help them govern, they didn't find it there. So what did they do? The British notion that India was a traditional or custom-based and community-based society, and not only based on communities but on religious communities, they started looking for laws and customs that were traditional, that were Hindi and Muslim, to create their legislation. So the codes were first, they talked about gentus, which were the Bengali gentlemen. The first code was a code of gentu laws. It's a very important to establish the community and religious-based society other than a very composite or mixed society, which is what the truth was. So the work of scholars and researchers was finding Sanskrit laws based on religious texts. In the glorious Hindi, India, that also took shape in the 18th century. Then in the 19th century, utilitarian laws were very, very different in their approach to governing India. But they were also, they also based their work on what their predecessors had used to try to govern India better. So that's what they sought to do, to classify India, understand it very well so that they could govern. New U utilitarian, liberal, protestants in the first half of the 19th century led to a lot of debate regarding education, the caste system, the social reform, and the condition of women. Very recently I was invited by CNN to talk about this. And they already know what I was going to say, so I don't know why they invited me. But the condition of women in India, we're talking about a great population. We know that the conditions of women are terrible. They wanted to prove and to show that in that program, even though it's already known. But oh well. Since the first half of the 19th century, this custom of sati, which was very exceptional. And what was the custom of some wives to die in their husband's funeral because they didn't want to be widows because that was a, a very it was very bad for a woman to be a widow, so they killed themselves in the funeral. It was actually not a common 
tradition. It was very exceptional. But as you now know, now women are sometimes killed when their husbands die, and that's another uh, a topic, uh, a whole other topic of discussion. I'm almost getting to the end of my presentation, but are you still following me? So far, so good. Well, when the evangelists came and they attacked the barbarian uh, Indian practices as sati of women setting themselves on fire during their husband's funeral services to avoid being a widow led to uh, heated debates on the status of women as well as the presence of the British East India Company in India. British education also started to be brought to India to create a westernized education system for Indians. So Indians reflected on their society in a way that was unprecedented. This led to the imperceptible notion of nationalism and little by little it gained strength. So for the second half of the 19th century, religion and the caste system became the key elements to understand Indian society, as was settlement of land and income that led to utilization of land that led to agriculture suffering. The company always dealt with peasant revolts, and in, nine, in 1857 there was a revolt of Indian soldiers and local princes, as well as the peasant population and tribal population that led to the downfall of the British East India Company, and, they, and then India became a direct colony of the United Kingdom in 1858. In 1858, Queen Victoria's proclamation offered institutional reforms so that eventually Indians could be prepared for self-government. The promise of a representative self-government with sources like the census which divided Indians according to religion and caste had a deep impact. Muslims, who used to be the old reigning group, were now a minority. And the great population of untouchables and lower case became aware of how strong they were in terms of numbers and they started to demand representation in education, public employment, and by the end of the 19th century, this struggle had already began, although it gained strength in the 20th century. So the nationalist struggle that was born in the political arena under the leadership of the National Indian Congress founded in 1955 had to lead with these demands that were latent. So what happened was that the nationalist struggle did not combat the terms established by the colonial rule and the different notions of an independent India could not be well understood by a single scheme. So the Indian independence led to the massive tra tragedy of the creation of India and Pakistan in 1947. The independent country inherited the cultural and sociopolitical and religious diversity, and parliament became aware of it and tried to guarantee sociopolitical parity as well as justice for underprivileged groups, the untouchables and other forgotten groups. That led to the creators of the Constitution to incorporate so-called compensatory discrimination, restoration in India, and legal pluralism. The Constitution gives every Indian citizen an equal right under the law, regardless of distinctions of sex, religion, culture, caste, etc. And they give special privileges to some underprivileged groups or marginalized groups like Dalits and other untouchables to compensate their disfavored or marginalized status because of tradition. They have reserved seats in educational institutions, public institutions, in public employment, and the, in, in the electoral constitu constituencies. 
This was implemented originally as a temporary measure for two years so that the underprivileged groups could come to parity with other groups with equal conditions and equal rights. But of course, this goal hasn't been achieved. So more groups have risen to ask for special privileges because they have been traditionally marginalized. And that has led to a very strong reaction in the upper castes and upper groups. And that has led the Indian right wing to advance. As you know, the current Indian government is a right wing government. Also, civil, the creation of civil liberty laws has led to legal plurality that seems to be inclusive, seems to be very good, but that leads to many problems and limitations. The heterogeneous nature of India can be seen in every aspect of the country. The economy has moved from a controlled state socialism under Prime Minister Nehru with a central planning carried out by the Planning Commission in India, and it is still very important as an institution. Now there are five-year plans for government. And we still have, despite the liberalization process, we still do have the five-year plans that are always planned and presented by the central government with recognized economists who are very renowned. So India has come from a very protectionist policy, protection of the infant industries in India that try to get them to accomplish parity. So there used to be a pr protection, pr protectionist socialism, and now there is an even greater importance of the public institutions. Now, little by little, India has moved towards liberalization under Indira Gandhi to a complete liberalization in the 1990s. The Indian economy has grown, but resources have not been equally or justly distributed. A very fast urbanization has changed the social landscape, the social cultural identities have remained mixed. But they have also become more severe at some moments. The struggle of women have also led to changes, but prejudices are far from being a thing of the past. The caste system has also changed, but it remains. All in all, India, with its very rich diversity in terms of clothes, language, religion, its mixed economy, social hierarchies, and economic disparity, represents a wonderful example of the chaos of the social worlds that we live in, and it allows us to reflect upon new ways of thinking, new ways of thinking about democracy, about differences, about citizenships, laws, class, privileges, and of course, wealth and poverty. Thank you very much. I just want to show you the pictures that I have here. This is the sacred city, Varanasi, that is Jama Masjid, which is in Delhi, a mosque. And well, to me, this is extremely more interesting than New Delhi, old Delhi. And then some other pictures that I want to share with you. That is the Golden Temple in Amritsar. It's a Sikh temple. And as you can see, this is a Portuguese Catholic church in Goa, which is where the Portuguese had control even up until 1960, talking about a permanence that they had from the 15th to the 20th century. Then Mahabodhi and the famous Kajurajo, which is very famous because of the Kama Sutra. It has panels there, but you know, it's what is projected there in that temple of Kajuraho. This is a Buddhist temple, Bodh Gaya. The next slide, please. Some festivities. This is a Muslim festivity parade where they go and they commemorate the Battle of Karbala that is in the south of India, which is also very famous. The use of a lot of colors. 
that is Rumba Puja, the, the Festival of Lights, which you might also be familiar with. I wanted to show you this. This is Muslim as well. It's a division to colors for the festivity. So that notion that Hindi and Muslims are the only ones there, well, not necessarily. And then the six. That's New Delhi. This is Delhi. The pictures on the upper side of the slide are Delhi, and the bottom is New Delhi, a colonial structure on the bottom right, and well, New Delhi and the modern structures in the bottom left. And then this is my city of origin, Kolkata, a very famous river a bridge over the Ganges River. This is a part of the University of Calcutta, colonial buildings, and the Victoria Memorial, which is a building that commemorates Queen Victoria. Mumbai, that is called Gateway, Gateway of India. Colonizers always arrived in the coast, in the port, so that was the gateway to India. Then famous, very famous Bollywood, Victoria train station, the terminal, which, as I told you, trains work wonderfully in India, and the roads in Mumbai. And then Chennai, the same thing, the train station, temples, temples over the sea. The Cricket Club, and the next picture, please. The main universities in India, at least the biggest three. In 1857, they were established right before the revolt. Calcutta, Mumbai, and Chennai. The next slide, please. OK. And some pictures of, of women, and the status of women. Daily activities, as you can see, women are still working in agriculture because rice requires a lot of work for its harvest, so it is very often done by women. Next slide, please. Some other daily activities of women. Food, food that you can eat out in the streets in India, offerings and ritualistic food. The next slide. Or day-to-day -day dishes from the south, from the northeast, also from the northeast, from Bengal. The next slide, please. Some desserts and sweets and then these are women women that work in the tea plantations as you can see another colonial um, creation Darjeeling tea and I rarely take this other tea on the left hand side because I am from Bengal there are other also very many coffee plantations and finally demonstrations so that you can see the social movement that can be seen in India. It is very, very strong. There's a little bit of everything. There's the go back killer Bush when Bush visited India. And here it says we don't want farmer suicide because it is we always hear about the economic growth of India, but at the same time, we see people suffering from poverty who end up committing suicide. Then this is a very recent um, demonstration against Israel, and then we see the reaction of police officers right here. And this, I think, is the last slide that I have. Women in action, rural women, rural women who were um, demonstrating against the World Bank, then we want justice over here. Um, International Women's Day, and more women from the mountain ranges. You see a lot of women, very, not the sophisticated women of Delhi, Calcutta, and Mumbai. So thank you very much for your patience in listening to my presentation. Thanks a lot, Doctor. We're going to ask um, Maurice Mubarak uh, to help us uh, give her a certificate and a token of her appreciation. Well, it's not that she's not part of this group. I mean, uh, we believe this is a valuable presentation because uh, the purpose of this seminar is uh, 
uh, in, in today's case, uh, India, is precisely to understand their culture. That's the most important point, so that uh, we can uh, then uh, establish uh, friendships and do business. To do that, you first need to uh, understand the culture. So it was a wonderful vision of uh, Indian culture. Couldn't have been better. And I believe that uh, we could be here speaking all day long about it. Uh, but uh, this was a very valuable presentation. Thank you, uh, doctor. Uh, we uh, worked uh, a lot uh, with her um, uh, 